Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. It's Wednesday, so you know what that means. Yep, it's time for another midweek mini mail call. This time I'm just gonna be showing one item or one batch of items from one of my viewers. I'm trying to keep the videos a little shorter, so hopefully I can make more of them. So without further ado, let's get right to it. All right, looks like we have one. I'm holding it up this way because there's a packaging label here. It comes from Rick in Oak Bank, Manitoba. That's cool. Hi to all my viewers in Manitoba. That's in Canada, of course. I don't know if I've ever gotten a package from anyone in Manitoba before. We have a note and lots of packing material here. The note from Rick reads, I've been watching your channel for a while now and I decided to send you some computer parts. There are a few older ISA cards, including sound cards, network cards, and a hard drive controller, and a large selection of dip chips, and a number of older CPUs. Many are new and never used. I suspect most of this stuff works, but I have no way to test any of it. All right, so yes, we have an MFM hard drive controller card, and we have an ISA network card. We have a Creative Sound Blaster 16. This is a CT2940, good card. We have another sound card, it looks like an Aztec sound card and it's got a modem in it. So it's probably one of those wind modem or, you know, voicemail capable modems where you could have it record your, answer your phone and record your messages and stuff like that. Here's another sound card slash modem. It's has Rockwell chips on it as well. This one comes with some floppy disks here. It says the sound galaxy card, okay. All right, and we have some more of those Simverters here. 72 pin to 30 pin adapters. Very cool, there's three of those. I've shown that on the channel before. Here's a CH dual port game card. Looks like an 8-bit ISA network card and it has coax, but I'm thinking this might be a token ring card. And we have another 16-bit ISA network card. And here's the cornucopia of dip ICs he mentioned. So cool, thanks Rick from Manitoba. Let's take a look at this stuff on the bench. All right, here are all the goodies from Rick. Let's take a closer look at this stuff. So in no particular order, I'm assuming this is an Aztec sound card. Don't really recognize it. Has SRS, that was sort of a pseudo 3D surround sound with two speakers technology that was relatively popular in the 90s. I remember TVs had that. Made in Singapore. There are jumpers for COM ports. Now, of course, this is a sound card plus a modem in one, right? So there's a phone jack right here for the telephone line. You have a MIDI slash joystick port and we have the audio jacks. This little board here has a Rockwell chip on it. I'm assuming that this is the modem portion. This is sort of analog front end things for the modem. And there's actually a Yamaha OPL sound chip on here. So kind of cool. Let me try to prop up the card to reduce the glare. So we have COM port settings here. We have base IO, which would imply the Sound Blaster compatibility that this thing probably has. And the fact that it's got an OPL chip means that the ad lib part is gonna be good. It's not gonna sound like crap. The date on the OPL chip here is 1995. So this is relatively late in the run of sound cards. Hence the modem that's integrated into this thing. I would say this is probably emulating a Sound Blaster Pro though, so it's not Sound Blaster 16, which limits the usefulness to some extent. Not much to report on the back other than this sticker here with uh, AZSC51466023, whatever that is. And this 40 pin connector here says Panasonic CD-ROM, so this is not a regular IDE interface. And here's the next sound card. This one has these floppy disks here. Sound Galaxy, Passport Tracks for Windows, HSC Interactive Custom Edition, disk one of two. So there must be another floppy disk that was not included with this. This card is not completely dissimilar from this other one. Has an OPL sound chip right here, analog devices, large IC. There's an Aztec chip here, and then it has some Rockwell chips 
This thing had just this chip as Rockwell. That might be under there as well. So it seems like this one maybe is a little bit older because it has more of these ICs here. There's a base IO setting right there, and this has SRS as well. This capacitor looks like it's been ripped off. Not a whole lot to report with this. And on the back, <laughs> we have a very similar sticker. And we have the same set of ports that are on this. They're just in a slightly different configuration. I found some information on the chipset for this card. It's the AZT2316, some kind of third generation chipset from Aztec. Also, I found a little bit of information on the two cards here. Well, actually one of them for sure, the other modem card there looks a little different. One says it was an OEM for Packard Bell. Overall, these are Sound Blaster 2 compatible cards with the Windows sound system. So kind of ho-hum, except for the actual OPL chip that's on these. Oh yeah, I just noticed here it says copyright Aztec Systems Limited. So if anyone had one of these sound cards back in the day and you recall how it worked, uh, please let me know in the comment section below. I really do prefer to use actual Creative Lab Sound Blaster cards just for the ultimate incompatibility. These types of cards just can be hit and miss sometimes. The fact that it's OPL means it's going to have that perfect ad lib, but the Sound Blaster emulation may be not so great. Not to mention if it's Sound Blaster Pro, it's only 8-bit, so you're lacking all the 16-bit sound capabilities that Sound Blaster 16 gives you. Okay, next up, we have an actual Sound Blaster 16 here. We have a CT2940. Now, it's all a bit confusing to me which one are the Vibras and those cheap ones, the value additions that people don't want. But the fact is, it seems like they've really gone and integrated everything into this IC. Where's the OPL chip? It's missing. I think it's inside of this. And from what I understand, when you have the OPL chip inside this main ASIC, the compatibility is not great. It, it works. It certainly works. But it's just not as good. That doesn't sound quite right as a true Yamaha branded synthesizer chip. This does have an actual IDE interface here though, so I guess that's something. And these are LS245 bus transceivers to support the IDE interface. And this is another bus transceiver down here, in case anyone thought that that was the OPL synthesizer. This card is from 1995, so of course this is a completely plug-and-play Sound Blaster card, hence the lack of any jumpers. But that's not a big detriment. You can definitely use these perfectly well in DOS. Creative Labs put out some pretty good software. I have my bench PC right here so I can give this Sound Blaster card a test. A little Bose speaker hooked up, and this machine actually already has the Sound Blaster 16 software on it. So this plug and play card should just work in this machine, hopefully. <laughs> this is really not an ideal setup because I don't have the VGA on this hooked up to a capture device. All I have is the little monitor connected, which is not ideal. While I wait for this computer to boot up, I'm going to talk about this camera angle. So last time I tried this, the exposure was horrible. It was all over the place. And I think it's because the camera does some face detection. Sometimes it tries to expose everything based on this mat right here, which is pretty white, or my face. So I think I turned it off. I switched the metering mode. So I'm hoping I don't get that ramping, that exposure hunting that the Sony camera does sometimes. So I apologize if it's doing it, but hopefully it's better. Okay, so this thing booted up. I'm going to run Cubic Player. I know you can't really see what's going on, but there's nothing to really see. It's just Cubic Player running on a Pentium. And I'm just going to pick a random mod file and see if there's any sound. Uh, no. This is definitely... Oh, there we go. <laughs> okay, it was just a bad connection on the speaker. So that's Cubic Player there, working fine. Switch to a different song. Sounds great, we're getting good stereo separation. That's totally working. So 16-bit sound play playback is perfect. In fact, why am I even doing this? I can just run the Diagnose tool. That's the Sound Blaster tool for testing the card, because that is on here. Diagnose. So if anyone had a Sound Blaster, they're going to be well aware of this program because <laughs> everyone used this thing. So it allows you to set up your base I.O. and you know, the MPU address, and that will configure the card here if it's a plug-and-play card like this one is. Incidentally, this has DSP version 4.13, and I know there's certain DSP versions that 
have weird issues like note hang on ad lib and stuff like that. So let's see how this works. I'm just going through the setup here. Okay. Okay. So let's try 8 bit digitized sound, both channels. 8 bit testing. Who remembers that? 8 bit testing. And then here is the 16 bit, both channels. 16 bit testing. 16 bit testing. And finally, there's synthesized music, which is the OPL music. There it is. And that's OPL3 testing because it's actually playing in stereo. And for compatibility with the AdLib, I'm just going to run the AdLib jukebox program here. So highways, here we go. Okay, exit out of there. Okay, so this card clearly is working perfectly. These cards are very reliable and that's exciting because even though this may not be like the real deal with the OPL chip on here, still nice to have a good working sound card. So I am just gonna draw a check mark on here. In fact, I'm just gonna write Rick in the corner as well. So I know where that card came from. All right, let's go down the list to the next thing. Here it is. This is the Game Card 3 Automatic from CH Products. Double game port action on the back there, so you can plug in two joysticks, not just one. Honestly, uh, these are cool, but I like to have sound cards in all my machines. Although, actually, now that I think about it, this is perfect for a machine that has, say, an AdLib card or an AdLib clone. And that's because, of course, AdLibs don't have uh, game ports built in. It's really not much to it, as you can see here. It's very simplistic how this works. Every single one of these is a standard TTL Logic chip, except for this one, which was a which is a five five eight timer. All right, here is the next card. So this is some kind of a network card, obviously coax AUI. It had the capability of having ten base T, and they left it off. How rude! Now, being this chip here is a, what is this like a National Semiconductors DP. 8390, uh, this, is this like an NE2000 card or any 1000 card? Uh, these would be like Novell standard cards. Novell came up with a standard that they allowed anyone to make a card to be compatible with. And because of that, when you have a card that follows either the NE1000 or NE2000 standard, you don't have to go find bespoke drivers for the card because generally the, you just find the uh, NE2000 drivers or the NE1000 drivers, and there's ones for DOS and Linux and all sorts of other OSs. You just install those and you're up and running. The back doesn't have much going on except for the MAC address here. And we have a sticker here that says WD8013EP. WD is this Western Digital card. Do they make this thing? And here is another network card. Does say up in the corner here, Acton or something, EN1642. That implies to me, now correct me if I'm wrong, is this thing token ring? 16 slash four megabits? Maybe not, but that is very suspect there. This card's not too dissimilar to the other one. They both have this similar little module here that's not exactly the same, but certainly very, very similar. And then this looks like to be SRAM. This is the card we just looked at. And this one has SRAM right here as well. Obviously though, the main chip is different than this card. So I don't know if these are related in any way, but maybe these are both NE2000. For this national semiconductor chip, I went and found the data sheet for it and it is just standard ethernet. This is not token ring. So right there, IEEE 802.3, ethernet two, thin ethernet or Starland, whatever that is. Oh, and I just noticed right here, it says WDC. So this is definitely a Western digital card. So anyhow, this is definitely ethernet. Let me look up the part number on this IC right here. Yeah, I can find absolutely nothing for this chip. I've tried searching for EN50903 and 1119D and neither of those bring up anything. So if anyone has any ideas about this one, please let me know in the comment section. 
Okay, and the next card here, this says ICOT Corp Cut Coax Adapter. And the thing that gives it away is this indented slot adapter on the back here for the coax connector. Now the main IC is a CHIPS 82C570 and there's a whole lot of switches here. I think what this is, is this is something similar to what I got on another mail call episode recently. I think this is an IBM 3270 card. I just did a quick Google search and yeah, look, chips link, single chip 3270 bit savers. This is the data sheet here. Implements the IBM 3270 communication protocol. There it is. On chip 4.7 MIPS microcontroller. Very fancy. So kind of amusing to have gotten two 3270 cards relatively recently. I don't remember where that card was that I found, but I definitely had another one of these. So now there's two. I certainly won't be hooking up to any 3270s anytime soon. So if anyone can think of a cool use for a card like this, please let me know. I'm just gonna write 3270 up at the top here so I, I can remember that that's what this is. All right, next up is this card. It's a good old Western Digital MFM hard drive controller and it's the 16-bit variant. It's the WD1003-WAH. These are useful if, of course, you have a need for MFM hard drive controllers. I seem to have a lot of 8-bit cards, but I don't have a whole lot of 16-bit cards, although I think I'm good at this point. Um, this is maybe my fourth one. So there you go, but it does not have a floppy controller. It is strictly just the hard drive. I just did a quick Google search here, and of course I found the information about this card. Now, one thing that does sort of bum me out, this is a WAH is the part number. And right here it says WD1003WH2 MFM hard drives, that's SD506. There is the RAH variety, and that supports two RLL drives which I have never encountered. I've never encountered the 16-bit controller that supports RLL drives. I wanted to make a video talking about the difference between MFM and RLL, and I definitely have 8-bit cards that use RLL, but I've just never come across a 16-bit card. I assume that's because by the time people were sort of moving on with the hard drive technology, IDE drives had come out, and they started replacing all of these ST506 type cards. So. RLL was sort of late in the game when it comes to the ST506 drives, and I think 286s had moved on to IDE. But XTs, on the other hand, because they kept selling XTs for a while, they were cheap computers. I think XTs stayed on the older ST506 drives for longer, just because you couldn't natively or easily use a regular modern IDE hard drive, you know, ones that were coming out on an XT because of the whole 8-bit bus versus 16-bit bus. So people were using ST506 drives, the old MFM types, or they were using the RLL chipsets to get more capacity for longer on the XTs. It's kind of my theory. If anyone has any thoughts about that, definitely put a comment down below. I'm just gonna write on here MFM. So I realize later that that's what this is without having to look it up. All right, next up we have these, the Simverters. And I've covered these on the channel before. What these allow you to do is they take regular 30-pin memory modules, as you see here, and then they adapt four of them to work on a 72-pin socket. So if you're upgrading your computer and you happen to have a bunch of this memory, well, this is one way to reuse some of that memory. Now, I'm pretty sure I talked about this before, but each one of these 30-pin SIMs is 8 bits wide, but when you have a 486 or even a Pentium, you need a minimum of a 32-bit wide memory module, which is what this connector is here, 72 pin. Or in the case of a Pentium, you need actually 64 bits wide. So when it comes to using 72 pin memory on a Pentium, you need to use two at the same time. But you, on a 46, you can just stick one of these in at a time. Now I showed this in the last video when I talked about these and I forgot where that was or which video that was, but there is two different models of this adapter. And it says model A on all three of these. And that's because in a typical motherboard, these are gonna be too big to put together in the slot. So the Model A and the Model B, one of them is designed to go into the slot in this orientation. So if you're just gonna use two of these, they can be put into the motherboard 
close enough. Now it does block the other adjacent slots that would be next to it, so there is that, but that does allow you to use some of your memory. One nice thing about these adapters is the SIM slots are metal, or have metal clips, which means you can easily remove these without fear of breaking these. The other thing is though, I think that these memory modules are four megs each. Well, I just grabbed this memory module out of my bag of memory and it's marked with a one for one megabyte. And the chips are both 4400, so they have the same part number. So these might both be one megabyte, unfortunately. I have a chip here that I took out of this tube and this was the memory that I was installing on those um, open source PCBs for memory modules, the ones that someone sent me uh, that was a project on GitHub. And I know it's gonna be impossible to read it, but this says TC5117400CSJ Toshiba chips. And this memory module here has tc 514 four zero zero asj-70 so yeah i think these are one meg and think these are one meg and i think all of these i think all of these are one megabyte unfortunately because uh these are the more rare four meg variety so two of these chips makes up four megabytes oh yeah and i just realized another easy way to tell is there are additional pins because the additional memory requires more address lines and you notice right here this doesn't have as many and nor do the modules that are on here. So these are all definitely one megabyte. I had my hopes up, but unfortunately the reality has set in. I will add that these things are more novelties than anything else because I mean, I'm in a good situation where Rami is well fed and I have tons and tons of 72 pin memory. So I don't necessarily need to use anything like these simverters. It's just a cool novelty uh, that these exist. And that was really to help people reuse the old memory that they had when they bought a new computer so they didn't have to throw stuff away. It's kind of like it is today. You know, you have these DDR3 and then you buy a new computer and you need DDR4. What do you do with the old memory? Like you might have 32 gigs of it. You just can't do anything with it. It's sort of useless unless you have an old computer to put it in. And I'm just going to do what I always do. And I'm just going to write ones on all of these chips. And that will just help me know that these are one meg modules. That leaves us with the last thing that Rick sent, and it's this slew of awesome IC chips. Let's take a look at these. All right, so this one appears to be filled with processors. So we have a V20 there, very useful. Oh, it's got a little bit of corrosion on it though. That should be fine though. So this would be an 8088 compatible IC. This chip here is an 8048 microcontroller. So these were typically used for keyboard implementation to communicate from like an XT or an AT keyboard to the main PC. But of course an 8048 is a general purpose microprocessor or microcontroller rather. It can be used for all sorts of things. So who knows how this one is configured. Uh, this would be a mask ROM version. So it's not like it's particularly usable. It's probably already been burned. Intel made this version of them as well, which of course has an EEPROM window. So you can erase the flash and reprogram them uh, at a future time. So that's kind of cool. This is an 8742, so it may not be exactly the same, but I'm pretty sure they made 8048s um, that were just like this as well. All right, we have an 8088, an 8088. Here's an 88-2, which is uh, faster. These are 4.77 megahertz. This is up to like eight, I think. Regular 8088, 8237, so that's some kind of microcontroller. And so is this from AMD. 8049, I assume. I don't even know what 8049s are. I have to look that up. And the last one is a 4650, which is a CRT controller. So I'll put that aside. Let me do a quick Google on these. And indeed, these Oki chips are also just um, 8048 versions. Now, there's all sorts of different process versions they had on these different chips, and they changed the part number. So there's a decent Wikipedia article on there if you're interested. I'm just moving the processors off of this so I can kind of organize the chips, but it's pretty cool. This one, Intel chip says copyright 78 and 81. So I assume this is a pretty old, oh, here, 1982, right there. So this probably was one of the ones used on, on the original IBM uh, 5150 or 5160. This AMD one here also, oh, it's from 84. So it's a little bit newer. Still a nice ceramic package on these versus these later ones here, which are 
just plastic, less interesting. All right, the next strip of chips here. So we have CRT controller. So it's the same as this one that was on the other sheet. This is a Hitachi 4650, which is compatible with the 6845. So there are three of those. And then here is a, a UM6845, so that's a clone. And then here is a 6545, which I think the 6845 is just a slightly improved version of this chip. But I think if your system is using um, this, you can put one of the 6845s like they are interchangeable, I think. These CRT controller chips are used pretty ubiquitously in the early 80s. CGA cards use them. Um, Commodore PET uses one. I mean, they're just all over the place uh, when a CRT is being driven and there's just not a lot of high colors or not a lot of memory. Let's just slide to the bottom here real quick. I just, I have to look up what these chips are, but we have Z80B CPU, Z80 CPU, Z80 CPU, and there's an NEC 780C, which I'm 99.9% .9 positive is also a Z80 CPU. So we have four CPUs there, very handy. These types of chips are pretty reliable. They generally don't fail. So luckily I have several in stock and it's nice to have some extras. All right, so back to this, we have 82C11, there's three of those. These are printer interface adapters, like parallel interfaces. And then the top one is an 8255. So the 8255, this, uh, the C version is just like a high speed version. It's just like a programmable IO device. I thought those were used for serial, but uh, no, I guess not. It's just general IO. Definitely used on the PC though to drive things. I think this is really kind of equivalent to the 6522 IO chip that's used on the PET and, and uh, um, other 6502 based systems like disk drives and stuff. It's like the Intel version of it. It's designed for the 8086, 8088, and well, probably the 8-bit processors, but you could use it on a 286 as well, stuff like that. All right, moving on to the last sheet. We'll start at the bottom here. So this is an 8088. Let's see if we can find a date code on this. It looks pretty old, 1981, Malaysia. Love it. It's a little scratched up. And there's another one of these, and this one has a date code, 1981 from the Philippines. All right, 8048, 8048, 8048, and one more that's an 8035, which I'm assuming is just another one of these. These ICs are 8253s, and I, you know, I don't know the part number off the top of my head, but I wouldn't be surprised. I'll look this up, but I bet you this is either like an IM, um, IRQ controller, interrupt controller, or a DMA controller. Oh no, I'm actually wrong. These are interval timers. So these are the timer chips, which I guess are probably used on the original XT and 286 and whatnot for things like the sound output, stuff like that. It says right here, the 82.5X chips or an equivalent circuit embedded in the larger chips are found in all IBM PC compatibles and Soviet computers like the Vector 06C. In PC compatibles, timer channel zero is assigned to IRQ zero Timer channel one is assigned to DRAM refresh, and timer channel two is assigned to the PC speaker. So that's right. So these are what are handling the PC speaker, and that's why the PC can make a beep without taking up CPU time because you actually set that up inside the timer, and then that generates the square wave output so you don't have to do it from the CPU, like on an Apple II. It says here that there's a CMOS variant that's good for 10 megahertz, and these are dash fives. They don't have a C, so I wouldn't be surprised if these are only good to five megahertz, AKA they only work on the original XT. Next up, we have this little hodgepodge of chips right here. This first chip here is a Z80BCTC, which appears to be some type of Z8 MCU microcontroller. So some kind of Zilog microcontroller. I'm not totally familiar with that. Next up, we have an Intel D8259A. This is the programmable interrupt controller that I thought those uh, timer chips were. So, so this chip handles interrupt zero through seven on an XT. And I think on a 286, you have two of these. One is cascaded to the other, and that's how you have those additional interrupt lines. Well, this chip right here is the Intel D8251A. And according to what I can find here, that's a programmable communication interface. So whatever that means, I don't know exactly. And this chip is another Intel 8253, so that's another timer. Might as well move that over next to these other ones. So they're all together. And lastly, we have a Zilog Z6132-6, 4K by 8 
QSRAM. I'm thinking that it's 4,000 bits and it's eight bits wide. So this is a 512 byte SRAM. So certainly not big at all. You'd need a lot of these to uh, give you any measurable amount of memory. But back in 1982 when this chip was made, it would have been pretty expensive. Here are the various chips like the timers and the interrupt controller that go on the XT. So these are good for repairing an old XT motherboard, for instance. Next up, we have CRT controllers, so that's very handy. Then we have uh, Z80 CPUs, Z80 CPUs, sorry, Intel 8088 CPUs, and one NEC V20, which of course is compatible with the 8088s, but a little bit faster. So it was a very nice upgrade for an XT. And with that, that's it for this mail call video. A huge thank to Rick from Manitoba for sending in all these awesome spare parts ICs, including some really old 8088s. That's pretty awesome. There are definitely some useful parts here for fixing XT machines, which I actually have an XT motherboard that's in need of some repair. So maybe some of these chips will come in handy. And of course, thanks for those ISA cards as well. Oh, and the SIM verters, SIM adapters, SIM adapters, whatever they're called. Anyhow, thank you very much again, and thanks to all my other viewers who've sent in stuff for mail call. I'll be trying to work my way through it. I'm trying to keep these a little bit more mini so I can make them a little bit more faster and I can put them out because I still do feel bad that I actually had one week that I skipped. Plus there was a week where it was not really a mail call item. It was something I got myself in. Anyways, anyhow. So yes, uh, that, <laughs> I'm sort of babbling at this point. Thanks to all my patrons. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen. If you want to become a patron as well, you could do so down below. Don't forget to subscribe, thumbs up, thumbs down, all that stuff, YouTube, comments, blah, 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 blah. Check out my second channel as well. I would really appreciate a sub over there. And I think I babbled for long enough. So thanks very much for watching. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.